So welcome to the other side of the tank, the gunner driver's position. Uh, it has just been described to me as a very easy tank to drive, but not an easy tank to drive well. Uh, I was reading uh, one of the British Army reports described the ride as akin to that provided by a camel because of the pitching effect caused by the short track base. Now, what he doesn't say is where he found a camel to make the comparison to, uh, but what can you do? Steering is done by use of the T-bar. Uh, you would almost be familiar with it from the M1 Abrams, except uh, instead of the twist being the throttle, that actually controls the elevation. The accelerator, or foot throttle, is located down by your right foot, where you would expect, and the brake is large on the left. Um, again, this is not a vehicle for short personnel. I do think I would be able to drive it, but I would not want to drive it for long. In event that this primary steering system fails, he does have two alternate control handles, and uh, that's a far more traditional steering system uh, with a clutch brake. Now, I say clutch brake, and that is actually one of the techniques for getting this thing to turn quickly. Now, if you're sitting still and you simply traverse the uh, handles, the vehicle will take about 12 seconds to do a 180 degree rotation, which is not bad, but it's not great. However, if you're driving along at a fair clip and then you pull hard with the controls, you're gonna do what's called the clutch brake steer. And this will basically get you from pointing one way to pointing the other way in two seconds flat. And if combined with, the, say, the Commander's Stabilized Seek system, uh, you can actually put onto targets off to your side probably faster than a conventionally turreted tank. Because, I mean, you simply take the second to swing over to the right and then you're on to the lay phase, as opposed to traversing the turret all the way. Of course, a fire on the move is not really an option on this. There is something in the manual about 200 yards, but no. Uh, maximum elevation and depression are 11 degrees in practice. Uh, you'll certainly see 12 and 10, but it's because the, uh, the gun is mounted one degree offset from the hull. Other controls to his front. Now, of course, in addition to driving, and he does have the rev counter and speedometer in front of him, the primary sight. He has the Unity Optic, which of course is also used primarily for driving. Uh, he has one additional optic for driving Unity off on the left-hand side. For the right, he is at the mercy of the commander's guidance. His field of vision forwards is actually pretty good because you have that long sloping front so the amount of dead ground is actually very small. And if he really wants to see close, he can even nose the tank forward and then he'll see right up close to the tank. It's uh, much better visibility than pretty much any other tank out there. Inside the primary sight, there are two circles. Each circle represents the field of vision for the different range scales. So your basic sight is a by six. Then you can go to a by 10 and then even a by 18, which is pretty reasonable. The primary sight, you can adjust the interocular distance and, of course, focus for the two. The reticle inside is complex uh, and has been, unfortunately, disparaged because of it. Uh, it consists of armor-piercing scale every 200 yards after, or meters, I'm sorry, every 200 meters after 600 meters, as far as about 2200. The HE scale, goes every 100 yards up to 4,000 meters and you also have the machine gun scale. Then you have additional points of aim depending on whether or not you expect a 5 km an hour crosswind or a 10 km an hour crosswind. There is no particular cant correction in the vehicle. The vehicle will not tilt side to side if you are firing on the side of a hill. Instead, in theory, what you're supposed to do is look at an inclinometer and it will tell you how much you are keeling over to one side and you aim off accordingly. In actuality, especially for firing AP, just aim center mass, the, the tilt is not likely to be sufficient to cause any significant change. And if you're firing high explosive, well, you just fire again. The T-bar controls also control obviously the gunnery system, uh, the various knobs and switches, the switchology as you might call it, uh, cannon and machine gun selector, safe and fire, uh, elevation, lock or free. And then you have the controls for loading the two different magazines, uh, a ready light when you are loaded, 
Button on the right for the laser rangefinder. Button on the left is fire. Finishing off in the front area here, we have boreside controls for vertical and horizontal adjustment. There are filters, so if you have lens, uh, sun glare or something like that, you can deal with that problem. Also allows better contrast maybe in certain lighting conditions. Now the problem with having only the one primary sight is that it's actually very difficult to determine whether or not your gun tube is clear with the berm that you're hiding behind. Uh, on let's say an M1 there's a coaxial telescope right down by the gun. If you see dirt you know you can't fire, if you see sky you know you're probably good. Uh, so short of practice or when you're in a position getting out of the tank, dropping the breech and looking through the tube, you have no way of knowing for sure. A couple of other little neat tricks about the sight. Uh, one is that when you fire there is a shutter for about a half a second the sight will close off and blank out and this will stop the gunner being blinded especially if he's shooting at night. Uh, another interesting feature is you can attach a gun camera. You simply mount it underneath and you can record the engagement as you're going either for if you want it for kills or more likely just for gunnery training is probably the best use. Today of course you have the food camera sight which is remotely transmitted. The loading cycle is about 3 seconds, a little bit less, but in practice your engagement times are probably going to be a little bit longer, partially because of obscuration and partially also simply because the tank is rocking backwards and forwards. But if you maintain pressure on the trigger as the tank is firing, it's basically a follow through, what will happen is the suspension will figure out where it is compared to where it was and it will resettle on the last point of lay. Now one of the nice things about the autoloader is that all the ammunition is immediately accessible. So you fire your engagement of let's say 10 rounds. If you're on a Centurion or something like that, you're now scrambling around trying to find the other ammunition scattered around the tank and restowing the loader's ready rack with it. With the S-Tank, the autoloader, every round is available until you run out of ammunition completely. The gun itself is a 62 caliber length modification based off of the British L7 rifle. And this added a little bit more uh, velocity, a little bit more accuracy, a little bit more punch. Uh, the Swedes did build their own ammunition. Transmissions. The early model vehicles had a two-stage transmission. You had a low gear for rough terrain and you had a high gear for easy going. In order to change from one to the other, you had to come to a complete halt, which is a little bit of a nuisance. By the C model, they had now changed it. It is very simply forwards, neutral, and back. Just to the rear of it, we have an inclinometer. It shows you whether or not you are actually level. And as you can see, we aren't. We found a stowage position for one of the universal tools. And if you look straight down, there is an escape hatch for the driver about the size of a moderately large New York pizza. So that's pretty much how you drive it, in theory. Let's take it for a spin. And push start. Well, that seems simple enough. Oh, it's very easy. Okay, the transmission light is on. There we go. A little bit of suspension. Okay, so I, I'm not doing this slowly. I mean, I, I can do this very slowly. Look, look, look at that small amount of elevation change. It is actually lifting. It's very difficult to see, very hard to perceive. So we can nudge it all the way down. So. It looks like elevation depends on where I leave the lever. So if I bring it back up to horizontal, the, ele the elevation of the tank will go horizontal as well. This, this is disconcerting. <laughs> this feels very strange. Okay, so that's as far down as we go. And I can see maybe three meters in front of the tank. So that's, that's actually amazing. Uh, let's bring it back up a little bit. You hear the hydraulics, uh, hydraulics pumping away as it moves the fuel from the rear of the tank to the, uh, the, front, uh, the front arms. And keep going all the way. I am not doing this as fast as it can go. And now we're at maximum elevation. Oh, okay, that took a second to catch up with hydraulics. 
and I now get a good shot at the drone that's flying above us. Okay, so we'll go back to horizontal again. We have figured out how to keep the tank more or less aiming in the right direction. Okay, so we have another switch for the gas turbine. Alright, is this like the Abrams where I have to press and hold? Okay, so I haven't started a turbine engine since my Abrams days back about 2008. stalled my first tank. So what, what happened there, if you, because you can't of course hear the intercom system, is I failed to apply sufficient accelerator while we were in gear to affect a turn. And I was a little bit reluctant because as soon as I let go of the brake, the tank started to go forwards. Uh, so lesson learned, it'll take me a go or two I'm sure. Now, hopefully I don't break the tank with all the starting and stopping.
uh, neutral. Well, that was it, the S-Tank. First ever clutch brake turn. Uh, that's a whole lot of stuff to take off. I'm just used to pulling off the CVC and that's it. I did manage to stall it a couple of times. The turbine is a little bit sensitive to pulling maneuvers if you don't use the accelerator. Something I'm not really used to from the M1, but hey, I got 1500 horse in the M1, so I guess there is that. So that was it, the famous S-Tank. Now you may have heard in Welder Tanks we're putting this in as a tank destroyer. That's purely for gameplay purposes. This was a tank. It was designed as a tank, it was issued as a tank, and used as a tank, expected to perform all the normal tank roles. In the 1970s, the British took 10 of them, took them for a six-month trial in Germany. And overall, it turned out to be a bit of a wash. Uh, it, certainly, the S-Tank had certain advantages, but especially by the time you start comparing with Chieftain, which had a newer Tur Traverse Motors had a stabilization system that was actually pretty reasonable. You start to see that the advantages of S-Tank are starting to become outweighed by the disadvantages. Come 2000, the writing was on the wall. The S-Tank, they tried to make the STRV 103D, didn't work out. The disadvantages at this point were just too pronounced and it had been replaced in service by the STRV 121 and 122, known to the rest of the world as Leopard 2. Of the 290 tanks that were built up until 1971, in the end, 29 C models were saved. The Swedes basically said, hey, who wants one? In addition to the Series 0 prototypes, eight of them, and two S1 and S2. They've been scattered around the world, from Fort Benning to Kubinka, from Bobbington to Pocapanio. So if you want to see an S-Tank in person, there's probably one within reasonable distance of you. Hope you enjoyed the tour. I know I did. I'll see you on the next one.